one. Scene, an apartment in young Honeywood's house. Enter Sir William Honeywood and Jarvis. Good Jarvis, make no apologies for this honest bluntness. Fidelity like yours is the best excuse for every freedom. I can't help being blunt and very angry too when I hear you talk of disinheriting so good, so worthy a young gentleman as your nephew, my master. All the world loves him. Say, rather, that he loves all the world. That is his fault. I'm sure there is no part of it more dear to him than you are, though he has not seen you since he was a child. What signifies his affection to me? Or how can I be proud of a place in a heart where every sharper and coxcomb find an easy entrance? I grant you that he is rather too good-natured, that he's too much every man's man, that he laughs this minute with one, and cries the next with another. But whose instructions may he thank for all this? Not mine, sure. My letters to him during my employment in Italy taught him only that philosophy which might prevent, not defend, his errors. Faith, begging your honor's pardon, I'm sorry they taught him any philosophy at all. It has only served to spoil him. This same philosophy is a good horse in the stable, but an errant jade on a journey. For my own part, whenever I hear him mention the name on it, I'm always sure he's going to play the fool. Don't let us ascribe his faults to his philosophy, I entreat you. No, Jarvis, his good nature arises rather from his fears of offending the importunate than his desire of making the deserving happy. What it arises from, I don't know. But to be sure, everybody has it that asks it. Aye, or that does not ask it. I have been now for some time a concealed spectator of his follies, and find them as boundless as his dissipation. And yet, faith, he has some fine name or other for them all. He calls his extravagance generosity, and his trusting everybody universal benevolence. It was but last week he went security for a fellow whose face he scarcely knew, and that he called an act of exalted uh, mu mu munificence. Uh, uh, yeah, that was the name he gave it. And upon that I proceed, as my last effort, though with very little hopes to reclaim him. That very fellow has just absconded, and I've taken up the security. Now... My intention is to involve him in fictitious distress before he has plunged himself into real calamity, to arrest him for that very debt, to clap an officer upon him, and then let him see which of his friends will come to his relief. Well, if I could but anyway see him thoroughly vexed, every groan of his would be music to me. Yet, Faith, I believe it impossible. I have tried to fret him myself every morning these three years, but instead of being angry, he sits as calmly to hear me scold as he does to his hairdresser. We must try him once more, however, and I'll go this instant to put my scheme into execution. And I don't despair of succeeding, as, by your means, I can have frequent opportunities of being about him without being known. What a pity it is, Jarvis! that any man's good will to others should produce so much neglect of himself as to require correction. Yet we must touch his weakness with a delicate hand. There are some faults so nearly allied to excellence that we can scarce weed out the vice without eradicating the virtue. Exit. Well, go thy way, Sir William Honeywood. It is not without reason that the world allows thee to be the best of men. But here comes his hopeful nephew, the strange, good-natured, foolish, open-hearted, and yet all his faults are such that one loves him still, the better for them. Enter Honeywood. Well, Jarvis, what messages from my friends this morning? You have no friends. Well, for my acquaintance, then. Jarvis, pulling out bills. A few of our usual cards of compliment, uh, that's all this bill from your tailor this from your mercer and and this from the little broker in crooked lane 
He says he has been at a great deal of trouble to get back the money you borrowed. That I don't know, but I am sure we were at a great deal of trouble in getting him to lend it. He has lost all patience. Then he has lost a very good thing. There's that uh, ten guineas you were sending to the poor gentleman and his children in the fleet. I, I believe that would stop his mouth for a while at least. Aye, Jarvis, but what will fill their mouths in the meantime? Must I be cruel because he happens to be importunate, and to relieve his avarice leave them to insupportable distress? Sdeath, sir, the question now is how to relieve yourself. Yourself, haven't I reason to be out of my senses when I see things going at sixes and sevens? Whatever reason you may have for being out of your senses, I hope you'll allow that I am not quite unreasonable for continuing in mine. You are the only man alive in your present situation that could do so everything upon the waist. There's Miss Eichland and her fine fortune gone already, and upon the point of being given to your rival. I'm no man's rival. Your uncle in Italy preparing to disinherit you, your own fortune almost spent, and nothing but pressing creditors, false friends, and a pack of drunken servants that your kindness has made unfit for any other family. Then they have the more occasion for being in mine. Sa, so, what will you have done with him that I caught stealing your plate in the pantry? In the fact, I caught him in the fact. In the fact? If so, I really think that we should pay him his wages and turn him off. He shall be turned off at Tiburn the dog. We'll hang him, if it be only to frighten the rest of the family. No, Jarvis, it's enough that we have lost what he has stolen. Let us not add to it the loss of a fellow creature. Very fine. Well, here was the footman just now to complain of the butler. He says he does most work and ought to have most wages. That's but just, though perhaps here comes the butler to complain of the footman. Ah, that's the way with them all, from the scullion to the privy counsellor. If you have a bad master, they keep quarrelling with him. If they have a good master, they keep quarrelling with one another. Enter butler, drunk. Sir, I'll not stay in the family with Jonathan. You must part with him or part with me that's the ex ex exposition of the matter sir full and explicit enough but what's his fault good philip sir he's given to drinking sir and i shall have my morals corrupted by keeping such company <laughs> he has such a diverting way oh quite amusing I find my wines are going, sir, and liquors don't go without mouth, sir. I hate a drunkard, sir. Well, well, Philip, I'll hear you upon that another time, so go to bed now. To bed, let him go to the devil. Begging your honour's pardon, and begging your pardon, Master Jarvis, I'll not go to bed, nor to the devil neither. I have enough to do to my my cellar. I forgot your honour, Mr. Crocker is below. I came on purpose to tell you. Why didn't you show him up, Blockhead? Show him up, sir, with all my heart, sir. Up or down, all's one to me. Exit. Ah, we have one or the other of that family in this house from morning till night. He comes on the old affair, I suppose. The match between his son that's just returned from Paris and Miss Eichland, the young lady he's guardian to. Perhaps so. Mr. Croker, knowing my friendship for the young lady, has got it into his head that I can persuade her to what I please. Ah, if you loved yourself but half as well as she loves you, we should soon see a marriage that would set all things to right again. Love me? Sure, Jarvis, you dream. No, no, her intimacy with me never amounted to more than friendship, mere friendship. That she is the most lovely woman that ever warmed the human heart with desire I own. But never let me harbor a thought of making her unhappy by a connection with one so unworthy her merits as I am. No, Jarvis, it shall be my study to serve her, in spite of my wishes, and to secure her happiness, 
though it destroys my own. Oh, was ever the like? I want patience. Besides, Jarvis, though I could obtain Miss Richland's consent, do you think I could succeed with her guardian or Mrs. Croker, his wife, who, though both very fine in their way, are yet a little opposite in their dispositions, you know? Opposite enough, heaven knows, the very reverse of each other. She all laugh and no joke. He always complaining and never sorrowful, a fretful poor soul, that has a new distress for every hour in the four and twenty. Hush, hush, he's coming up, he'll hear you. On whose voice is a passing bell. Well, well, go do. A raven that bodes nothing but mischief, a coffin and a crossbones, a bundle of rue, a sprig of deadly nightshade, a... Honeywood, stopping his mouth, at last pushes him off. Exit Jarvis. I must own my old monitor is not entirely wrong. There is something in my friend Croker's conversation that entirely depresses me. His very mirth is quite an antidote to all gaiety, and his appearance has a stronger effect on my spirits than an undertaker's shop. Mr. Croker, this is such a satisfaction. Enter Croker. A pleasant morning to Mr. Honeywood, and many of them. How is this? You look most shockingly today, my dear friend. I hope this weather does not affect your spirits. To be sure, if this weather continues, I say nothing. But God send we be all better this day three months. I heartily concur in the wish, though I own not in your apprehensions. Maybe not. Indeed, what signifies what weather we have in a country going to ruin like ours? Taxes rising and trade falling money flying out of the kingdom and jesuits swarming into it i know at this time no less than a hundred and twenty-seven jesuits between charing cross and temple bar the jesuits will scarce pervert you or me i should hope maybe not indeed what signifies whom they pervert in a country that has scarce any religion to lose i am only afraid for our wives and daughters I have no apprehension for the ladies, I assure you. Maybe not. Indeed, what signifies whether they be perverted or no? The women in my time were good for something. I have seen a lady dressed from top to toe in their own manufactures formerly. But, nowadays, the devil a thing of their own manufactures about them, except their faces. But, however these faults may be practised abroad, you don't find them at home, either with Mrs. Croker, or Olivia, or Miss Richland. The best of them will never be canonised for a saint when she is dead. By the by, my dear friend, I don't find this match between Miss Richland and my son much relished, either by one side or the other. I thought otherwise. Ah, Mr. Honeywood. A little of your fine serious advice to the young lady might go far. I know she has very exalted opinion of your understanding. But would not that be usurping an authority that more properly belongs to yourself? My dear friend, you know but a little of my authority at home. People think, indeed, because they see me come out in the morning thus, a pleasant face, and to make my friends merry, that all's well within but i have cast that would break a heart of stone my wife has so enroached upon every one of my privileges that i am now no more than a mere lodger in my own house but a little spirit exerted on your side might perhaps restore your authority no though i had the spirit of a lion i do rouse sometimes but what then always haggling and haggling a man is tired of getting the better before his wife is tired of losing the victory. It's a melancholy consideration indeed, that our chief comforts often produce our greatest anxieties, and that an increase of our possessions is but an inlet to new disquietudes. Ha, ah, my dear friend, these were the very words of poor Dick Dolfell to me not a week before he made way with himself. Indeed, Mr. Honeywood, I never see you, but you put me in mind of poor Dick. Ha! There was a merit neglected for you. And so true a friend. We loved each other for thirty years, and yet 
he never asked me to lend him a single farthing pray what could induce him to commit so rash an action at last i don't know some people were malicious enough to say it was keeping company with me because we used to meet now and then and open our hearts to each other to be sure i loved to hear him talk and he loved to hear me talk poor dear dick he used to say that croker rhymed to joker and we used to laugh poor dick going to cry his fate affects me ha he grew sick of this miserable life where we do nothing but eat and grow hungry dress and undress get up and lie down while reason that should watch like a nurse by our side falls as fast asleep as we do to say a truth if we compare that part of our life which is to come by that which we have passed the prospect is hideous life at the greatest and best is but a forward child that must be humoured and coaxed a little till it falls asleep and then all the care is over very true sir nothing can exceed the vanity of our existence but the folly of our pursuits we wept when we came into the world and every day tells us why ha my dear friend it is a perfect satisfaction to be miserable with you my son leontin shan't lose the benefit of such a fine conversation i will just step home for him i am willing to show him so much seriousness in one scarce older than himself and what if i bring my last letter to the gazetteer on the increase and progress of earthquakes it will amuse us i promise you i there prove how the late earthquake is coming round to pay us another visit from london to lisbon from lisbon to canary islands from the canary islands to palmyra from palmyra to constantinople and so from constantinople back to london again exit poor croker his situation deserves the utmost pity i shall scarce recover my spirits these three days sure to live upon such terms is worse than death itself and yet when i consider my own situation a broken fortune a hopeless passion friends in distress the wish and not the power to serve them <sighs> enter butler more company below sir mrs croker and miss richland shall i show them up but they're showing up themselves exit enter mrs croker and miss richland you're always in such good spirits we have just come my dear honeywood from the auction there was the old deaf dowager as usual bidding like a fury against herself and then so curious in antiques herself the most genuine piece of antiquity in the whole collection excuse me ladies if some uneasiness from friendship makes me unfit to share in this good humour i know you'll pardon me i vow he seems as melancholy as if he had taken a dose of my husband this morning well if richland here can pardon you i must you would seem to insinuate madam that i have particular reason for being disposed to refuse it whatever i insinuate my dear don't be so ready to wish an explanation i own i should be sorry mr honeywood's long friendship and mine should be misunderstood there's no answering for others madam but i hope you'll never find me presuming to offer more than the most delicate friendship may readily allow and i shall be prouder of such a tribute from you than the most passionate professions from others my own sentiments madam friendship is a disinterested commerce between equals love and abject intercourse between tyrants and slaves and without a compliment i know none more disinterested or more capable of friendship than mr honeywood and indeed i know nobody that has more friends at least among the ladies miss fruz miss oddbody and miss winterbottom praise him in all companies and as for miss biddy bundle she's his professed admirer indeed an admirer i did not know sir you were such a favourite there but is she seriously so handsome is she the mighty thing talked of the town madam seldom begins to praise the lady's beauty till she's beginning to lose it smiling but she's resolved never to lose it it seems for as her natural face decays 
her skill improves in making the artificial one well nothing diverts me more than one of these fine old dressy things who thinks to conceal her age by everywhere exposing her person sticking herself up in the front of a side-box trailing through a minuet at almax and then in the public gardens looking for all the world like one of the painted ruins of the place every age has its admirers ladies while you perhaps are trading among the warmer climates of youth there ought to be some to carry on a useful commerce in the frozen latitudes beyond fifty but then the mortification they must suffer before they can be fitted out for traffic i have seen one of them fret a whole morning at a hairdresser when all the fault was her face and yet island gage has carried that at last to a very good market this good-natured town madam has husbands like spectacles to fit every age from fifteen to fourscore well you're a dear good-natured creature but you know you're engaged with us this morning upon a strolling party i want to show olivia the town and the things i believe i shall have business for you for the whole day i am sorry madam i have an appointment with mr croker which it is impossible to put off what with my husband then i am resolved to take no refusal nay i protest you must you know i never laugh so much as with you why if i must i must i'll swear you have put me into such spirits well do you find me jest and i'll find laugh i promise you we'll wait for the chariot in the next room exeunt enter leontine and olivia there they go thoughtless and happy my dearest olivia what would i give to see you capable of sharing in their amusements and as cheerful as they are how my leontine how can i be cheerful when i have so many terrors to oppress me the fear of being detected by this family and the apprehensions of a censuring world when i must be detected the world my love what can it say at worst it can only say that being compelled by a mercenary guardian to embrace a life you disliked you formed a resolution of flying with the man of your choice that you confided in his honour and took refuge in my father's house the only one where you could remain without censure but consider leontine your disobedience and my indiscretion your being sent to france to bring home a sister and instead of a sister bringing home one dearer than a thousand sisters one that i am convinced will be equally dear to the rest of the family when she comes to be known and that i fear will shortly be impossible till we ourselves think proper to make this discovery my sister you know has been with her aunt at lyons since she was a child and you find every creature in the family takes you for her but mayn't she write mayn't her aunt write her aunt scarce ever writes and all my sister's letters are directed to me but won't your refusing miss richland for whom you know the old gentleman intends you create a suspicion there there's my master stroke i have resolved not to refuse her nay an hour hence i have consented to go with my father to make her an offer of my heart and fortune your heart and fortune don't be alarmed my dearest can olivia think so meanly of my honour or my love as to suppose i could ever hope for happiness from any but her no my olivia neither the force nor permit me to add the delicacy of my passion leaves any room to suspect me i only offer miss richland a heart i am convinced she will refuse as i am confident that without knowing it her affections are fixed upon mr honeywood mr honeywood you'll excuse my apprehensions but when your merits come to be put in the balance you view them with too much partiality however by making this offer i show a seeming compliance with my father's command and perhaps upon her refusal i may have his consent to choose for myself well i submit and yet my leontine i own i shall envy her even your pretended addresses i consider every look every expression of your esteem as due only to me this is folly perhaps i allow it but it is natural to suppose that merit which has made an impression on one's own heart may be powerful over that of another don't my life's treasure don't let us make imaginary evils when you know we have so many real ones to encounter at worst you know if miss richland should consent and my father refuses pardon it can but end in a trip to scotland and enter croker where have you been boy i have been seeking you my friend honeywood here has been seeing such comfortable things ha he is an example indeed where is he 
I left him here. Sir, I believe you may see him and hear him too in the next room. He's preparing to go out with the ladies. Good gracious. Can I believe in my eyes and my ears? I am struck dumb with his vivacity and stunned with the loudness of his laugh. Was there ever such a transformation? A laugh behind the scenes. Croker mimics it. Ha ha ha. There it goes. A plague take their balladash. Yet, I could expect nothing less when my precious wife was of the party. On my conscience, I believe she could spread a horse laugh through the fuse of tabernacle. Since you find so many objections to a wife, sir, how can you be so earnest in recommending one to me? I have told you, and tell you again, boy, that Miss Richland's fortune must not go out of the family. One may find comfort in the money, whatever one does in the wife. But, sir, though in obedience to your desire I am ready to marry her, it may be possible she has no inclination to me. I'll tell you once for all how it stands. A good part of Miss Richland's large fortune consists in a claim upon government, which my good friend Mr. Lofty assures me the treasury will allow. One half of this she is to forfeit by her father's will, in case she refuses to marry you. So, if she rejects you, we seize half her fortune. If she accepts you, we seize the whole, and a fine girl into the bargain. But, sir, if you will but listen to reason. Come then, produce your reasons. I tell you, I am fixed, determined. So now, produce your reasons. When I am determined, I always listen to reason because it can then do no harm. You have alleged that a mutual choice was the first requisite in matrimonial happiness. Well, and you have both of you a mutual choice. She has her choice to marry you or lose half her fortune, and you have your choice to marry her or pack out of doors without any fortune at all. An only son, sir, might expect more indulgence. An only father, sir, might expect more obedience. Besides, has not your sister here that never disobliged me in her life as good a right as you? He is a sad dog, Livy, my dear, and would take all from you. But he shan't, I tell you, he shan't, for you shall have your share. Dear sir, I wish you'd be convinced that I can never be happy in any addition to my fortune, which is taken from his. Well, well, it's a good child, so say no more, but come with me, and we shall see something that will give us a great deal of pleasure, I promise you. Old Ruggins, the curry-comb maker, lying in state, I am told he makes a very handsome corpse, and becomes his coffin prodigiously. He was an intimate friend of mine. And these are friendly things we ought to do for each other. Exeunt. End of Act One. By Oliver Goldsmith. Act Two. Scene. Croker's house. Miss Richland, Garnet. Olivia, not his sister. Olivia, not Leontine's sister. You amaze me. No more his sister than I am. I had it all from his own servant. I can get anything from that quarter. But how? Tell me again, Garnet. Why, madam, as I told you before, instead of going to Lyons to bring home his sister, who has been there with her aunt these ten years, he never went further than Paris. There he saw and fell in love with this young lady, by the by of a prodigious family. And brought her home to my guardian as his daughter? Yes, and daughter she will be. If you don't consent to their marriage, they talk of trying what a Scotch parson can do. Well, I own they have deceived me. And so demurely as Olivia carried it, too. <sighs> Would you believe it, Garnet? I told her all my secrets, and yet the sly cheat concealed all this from me. And upon my word, madam, I don't much blame her. She was loth to trust one with her secrets, that was so very bad as keeping her own. But, to add to their conceits, the young gentleman, it seems, 
pretends to make me serious proposals my guardian and he are to be here presently to open the affair in form you know i am to lose half my fortune if i refuse him yet what can you do for being as you are in love with mr honeywood madam how idiot what do you mean in love with mr honeywood is this to provoke me that is madam in friendship with him i meant nothing more than friendship as i hope to be married nothing more well no more of this as to my guardian and his son they shall find me prepared to receive them i am resolved to accept their proposal with seeming pleasure to mortify them by compliance and to throw the refusal at last upon them delicious and that will secure your whole fortune to yourself well who could have thought so innocent a face could cover so much cuteness why girl you only oppose my prudence to their cunning and practise a lesson they have taught me against themselves then you're likely not long to want employment for here they come and in close conference enter croker and leontine excuse me sir if i seem to hesitate upon the point of putting to the lady so important a question lord good sir moderate your fears you are so plaguey shy that one would think you have changed sexes i tell you we must have the half or the whole come let me see with what spirit you begin well why don't you uh what well then i must it seems miss richland my dear i believe you guess at our business an affair which my son here comes to open that nearly concerns your happiness sir i should be ungrateful not to be pleased with anything that comes recommended by you to leontine how boy could you desire a finer opening why don't you begin i say tis true madam my my father madam has has some intentions <clears throat> of explaining an affair which him himself can best explain madam yes my dear it comes entirely from my son it is all a request of his own madam and i will permit him to make the best of it the whole affair is only this madam my father has a proposal to make which he insists none but himself shall deliver aside my mind misgives me the fellow will never be brought on in short madam you see before you one that loves you one whose whole happiness is all in you i never have any doubts of your regards sir and i hope you can have none of my duty that's not the thing my little sweetening my love no no another guess lover than i there he stands madam his very looks declare the force of his passion aside call up a look you dog but then had you seen him as i have weeping speaking soliloquies and blank verse sometimes melancholy and sometimes absent i fear sir he's absent now or such a declaration would have come most properly from himself himself madam he would die before he could make such a confession and if he had not a channel for his passion through me it would ad now have drowned his understanding i must grant sir these are attractions in modest diffidence upon the forced word a silent address is a genuine eloquence of sincerity madam he has forgot to speak any other language silence has become his mother tongue and it must be confessed sir it speaks too powerfully in his favour and yet i shall be thought too forward to make such a confession shan't i mr leontine aside confusion my reserve will undo me but if modesty attracts her impudence may disgust her i'll try don't imagine from my silence madam that i want a due sense of the honour and happiness intended me my father madam tells me your humble servant is not wholly indifferent to you he admires you i adore you and when we come together upon my soul i believe we shall be the happiest couple in all st james if i could flatter myself you thought as you speak sir doubt my sincerity madam by your dear self i swear ask the brave if they desire glory 
as cowards if they covet safety. Well, well, no more questions about it. Ask the sick if they long for health. Ask misers if they love money. Ask. Ask a fool if he can talk nonsense. What's come over the boy? What signifies asking when there is not a soul to give you an answer? If you would ask to the purpose, ask this lady's consent to make you happy. Why, indeed, sir, his uncommon ardour almost compels me, forces me to comply. And yet, I'm afraid he'll despise a conquest against with too much ease. Won't you, Mr. Leontine? Aside. Confusion! Oh, by no means, madam, by no means. And yet, madam, you talk to force. There is nothing I would avoid so much as compulsion in a thing of this kind. No, madam, I will still be generous, and leave you at liberty to refuse. But I tell you, sir, the lady is not at liberty. It's a match. You see, she says nothing. Silence gives consent. But, sir, she talked to force. Consider, sir, the cruelty of constraining her inclinations. But I say there is no cruelty. Don't you know, Blockhead, that girls have always a roundabout way of saying yes before company. So... Get you both gone together into the next room, and hang him that interrupts the tender explanation. Get you gone, I say. I'll not hear a word. But, sir, I must beg leave to insist. Get off, you puppy, or I will beg leave to insist upon knocking you down. Stupid wealth, but I don't wonder the boy takes entirely after his mother. Exeunt Miss Richland and Leontine. Enter Mrs. Croker. Mr. Croker, I bring you something, my dear, that I believe will make you smile. I'll hold you a guinea of that, my dear. A letter, and as I knew the hand, I ventured to open it. And how can you expect your breaking open my letters should give me pleasure? Pooh, it's from your sister at Lyons, and contains good news. Read it. What a Frenchified cover is here. That sister of mine has some good qualities but I could never teach her to fold a letter. Fold a fiddlestick. Read what it contains. Croker, reading. Dear Nick, an English gentleman of large fortune has for some time made private, though honourable proposals to your daughter Olivia. They love each other tenderly, and I find she has consented, without letting any of the family know, to crown his addresses. As such good offers don't come every day, your own good sense, his large fortune, and family considerations will induce you to forgive her. Yours ever, Rachel Croker. My daughter Olivia privately contracted to a man of large fortune? This is good news indeed. My heart never foretold me of this. And yet, how slyly the little baggage has carried it since she came home not a word on it to the old ones for the world yet i thought i saw something she wanted to conceal well if they have concealed their amour they shan't conceal their wedding that shall be public i'm resolved i tell thee women the wedding is the most foolish part of the ceremony i can never get this woman to think of the most serious part of the nuptial engagement what would you have me think of their funeral but come, tell me, my dear, don't you owe more to me than you care to confess? Would you have ever been known to Mr. Lofty, who has undertaken Miss Richland's claim at the Treasury, but for me? Who was it first made him an acquaintance at Lady Chaberoon's rout? Who got him to promise us his interest? Is not he a backstairs favourite, one that can do what he pleases with those that do what they please? is not he an acquaintance that all your groaning and lamentation could never have got us he is a man of importance i grant you and yet what amazes me is that while he is giving away places to all the world he can't get one for himself that perhaps may be owing to his nicety great men are not easily satisfied enter french servant an express from monsieur lofty he will be wait upon your honours instantment. He be only giving four or five instruction. Read two, three, memorial, 
call upon von ambassadeur he will be with you in one three minutes you see now my dear what an extensive department well friend let your master know that we are extremely honoured by this honour was there anything ever in a higher style of breeding all messages among the great are now done by express exit french servant to be sure no man does little things with more solemnity or claims more respect than he but he is in the right on it in our bad world respect is given where respect is claimed never mind the world my dear you were never in a pleasanter place in your life let us now think of receiving him with proper respect a loud rapping at the door and there he is by the thundering rap hi verily there he is as close upon the heels of his own express as an endorsement upon the back of a bill well i will leave you to receive him whilst i go to chide my little olivia for intending to steal a marriage without mine or her hand's consent i must seem to be angry or she too may begin to despise my authority exit enter lofty speaking to his servant and if the venetian ambassador or that teasing creature the marquis shall call i'm not at home damn me i'll be pack-horse to none of them my dear madam i i have just snatched a moment and uh, if the expresses to his grace be ready let them be sent off they're of importance uh, madam i ask ten thousand pardons sir this honour and du Bourdieu, if the person calls about the commission let him know that it is made out as for lord cumbercourt's stale request it can keep cold you understand me madam i ask ten thousand pardons sir this honour and du Bourdieu, if the man comes from the cornish borough you must do him you must do him i say madam i ask ten thousand pardons and if the russian ambassador calls but he will scarce call to-day i believe and now madam i have just got time to express my happiness in having the honour of being permitted to profess myself your most obedient humble servant sir the happiness and honour are all mine and yet i am only robbing the public while i detain you sink the public madam when the fair are to be attended ah could all my hours be so charmingly devoted sincerely don't you pity us poor creatures in affairs <sighs> thus it is eternally solicited for places here teased for pensions there <laughs> and courted everywhere <laughs> i know you pity me yes i see you do excuse me sir toils of empire's pleasures are as waller says waller waller is he of the house the modern poet of that name sir oh a modern we men of business despise the moderns and as for the ancients we have no time to read them poetry is a pretty thing enough for our wives and daughters but not for us why now here i stand that know nothing of books i say madam i know nothing of books and yet i believe upon a land carriage fishery a stamp act or a jag hire i can talk my two hours without feeling the want of them the world is no stranger to mr lofty's eminence in every capacity i vow to gad madam you make me blush i'm nothing 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 in the world a mere obscure gentleman to be sure indeed one or two of the present ministers are pleased to represent me as a formidable man i know they are pleased to bespatter me at all their little dirty levies uh, yet upon my soul i wonder what they see in me to treat me so measures not men have always been my mark and i vow by 
all that's honourable my resentment has never done the men as mere men any manner of harm that is as mere men what importance and yet what modesty oh if you talk of modesty madam there i own i'm accessible to praise modesty is my foible it was so the duke of brentford used to say to me i love jack lofty he used to say no man has a finer knowledge of things quite a man of information and when he speaks upon his legs by the lord he's prodigious he scouts them and yet all men have their faults too much modesty is his says his grace and yet i dare say you don't want assurance when you come to solicit for your friends oh there indeed i am in bronze apropos i have just been mentioning miss richland's case to a certain personage we must name no names when i ask i'm not to be put off madam no no i take my friend by the button a fine girl sir great justice in her case a friend of mine borough interest business must be done mr secretary i say mr secretary her business must be done sir that's my way madam bless me you said all this to the secretary of state did you i did not say the secretary did i well curse it since you have found me out i will not deny it it was to the secretary this was going to the fountain-head at once not applying to the understrappers as mr honeywood would have had us honeywood he 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 was indeed a fine solicitor i suppose you have heard what has just happened to him poor dear man no accident i hope undone madam that's all his creditors have taken him into custody a prisoner in his own house a prisoner in his own house how at this very time i'm quite unhappy for him why so am i the man to be sure was immensely good-natured uh, but then i could never find that he had anything in him his manner to be sure was excessively harmless some indeed thought it a little dull for my part i always concealed my opinion it cannot be concealed madam the man was dull dull as the last new comedy a poor impracticable creature i tried once or twice to know if he was fit for business but he had scarce talents to be groom porter to an orange barrow <laughs> how differently does miss richland think of him for i believe with all his faults she loves him loves him does she you should cure her of that by all means let me see what if she were sent to him this instant in his present doleful situation my life for it that works her cure distress is a perfect antidote to love suppose we join her in the next room miss richland is a fine girl has a fine fortune and must not be thrown away upon my honour madam i have a regard for miss richland and rather than she should be thrown away i should think it no indignity to marry her myself exeunt enter olivia and leontine and yet trust me olivia i had every reason to expect miss richland's refusal as i did everything in my power to deserve it her indelicacy surprises me surely auntine there's nothing so indelicate in being sensible of your merit if so i fear i shall be the most guilty thing alive but you mistake my dear the same attention i used to advance my merit with you i practised to lessen it with her 
What more could I do? Let us now rather consider what is to be done. We have both dissembled too long. I have always been ashamed. I am now quite weary of it. Sure I could never have undergone so much for any other but you. And you shall find my gratitude equal to your kindest compliance. Though our friends should totally forsake us, Livia, we can draw upon content for the deficiencies of fortune. Then why should we defer our scheme of humble happiness when it is now in our power? I may be the favorite of your father, it is true, but can it ever be thought that his present kindness to a supposed child will continue to a known deceiver? I have many reasons to believe it will. As attachments are but few, they are lasting. His own marriage was a private one, as ours may be. Besides, I have sounded him already at a distance, and find all his answers exactly to our wish. Nay, by an expression or two that dropped from him, I am induced to think that he knows of this affair. Indeed, but that would be a happiness too great to be expected. However it be, I am certain you have power over him, and I am persuaded if you informed him of our situation that he would be disposed to pardon it. You had equal expectations, Leontine, from your last scheme with Miss Richland, which you find has succeeded most wretchedly. And that's the best reason for trying another. If it must be so, I submit. As we could wish, he comes this way. Now, my dearest Olivia, be resolute. I'll just retire within hearing, to come in at a proper time, either to share your danger or confirm your victory. Exit. Enter Croker. Yes, I must forgive her, and yet not too easily, neither. It will be proper to keep up to the decorums of resentment a little, if it be only to impress her with an idea of my authority. How I tremble to approach him! Might I presume, sir, if I interrupt you? No, child. Where I have an affection, it is not a little thing that can interrupt me. Affection gets over little things. Sir, you're too kind. I'm sensible how ill I deserve this partiality. Yet heaven knows there is nothing I would not do to gain it. And you have but too well succeeded, you little hussy, you. With those endearing ways of yours, on my conscience, I could be brought to forgive anything, unless it is a very great offence indeed. But mine is such an offence, when you know my guilt. Yes, you shall know it, though I feel the greatest pain in the confession. Why, then, if it be so very great a pain, you may spare yourself the trouble, for I know every syllable of the matter before you begin. Indeed, that I'm undone. I miss. You wanted to steal a match without letting me know it, did you? But I am not worth being consulted, I suppose, when there is to be a marriage in my own family. Now I am nobody. I am to be a mere article of family lumber, a piece of cracked china to be stuck up in a corner. Dear sir, nothing but the dread of your authority could induce us to conceal it from you. No, no. My consequence is no more. I am as little-minded as a dead Russian in winter, just stuck up with a pipe in its mouth till there comes a thaw. Aside, it goes to my heart to vex her. I was prepared, sir, for your anger, and despaired of pardon, even while I presumed to ask it. But your severity shall never abate my affection, as my punishment is but justice. And yet you should not despair, neither, Livy. We ought to hope all for the best. And do you permit me to hope, sir? Can I ever expect to be forgiven? But hope has too long deceived me. Why then, child, it shan't deceive you now, for I forgive you this very moment. I forgive you all, and now you are indeed my daughter. Oh, transport, this kindness overpowers me. I was always against severity to our children. We have been young and giddy ourselves and we can't expect boys and girls to be old before their time. What generosity! But can you forget the many falsehoods, the dissimulation? You did indeed dissemble, you urchin. But where's the girl that won't dissemble for a husband? My wife and I had never been married if we had not dissembled a little beforehand. It shall be my future care never to put such generosity to a second trial. And as for the partner of my offence and folly, from his native honour, and the just sense he has of his duty, I can answer for him that— Enter Leontine. Permit him thus to answer for himself. Kneeling. Thus, sir, let me speak my gratitude for this unmerited forgiveness. 
Yes, sir, this even exceeds all your former tenderness. I now can boast the most indulgent of fathers. The life he gave, compared to this, was but a trifling blessing. And good, sir, who sent for you with that fine tragedy face and flourishing manner? I don't know what we have to do with your gratitude upon this occasion. How, sir, is it possible to be silent when so much obliged? Would you refuse me the pleasure of being grateful, of adding my thanks to my Olivia's? of sharing in the transports that you have thus occasioned? Lord, sir, we can be happy enough without you coming in to make up the party. I don't know what's the matter with the boy all this day. He's got into such a rhodomontard manner all this morning. But, sir, I that have so large a part in the benefit, is it not my duty to show my joy? Is the being admitted to your favor so slight an obligation? Is the happiness of marrying my Olivia so small a blessing? marrying olivia marrying olivia marrying his own sister sure the boy is out of his senses his own sister my sister aside sister how have i been mistaken aside ah some cursed mistake in all this i find what does the booby mean or has he any meaning here yeah, what do you mean you blockhead you mean sir why, uh, sir, uh, only when my sister is to be married that I have the pleasure of marrying her, sir, that is, of giving her away, sir. I have made a point of it. Oh, is that all? Give her away? You have made a point of it. Then you had as good make a point of first giving away yourself, as I am going to prepare the writings between you and Miss Richland this very minute. What a fuss is here about nothing? Why, what's the matter now? I thought I had made you at least as happy as you could wish. Oh, yes, sir. Very happy. Do you foresee anything, child? You look as if you did. I think if anything was to be foreseen, I have as sharp a lookout as another. And yet I foresee nothing. Exit. What can it mean? He knows something, and yet for my life I can't tell what. It can't be the connection between us, I'm pretty certain. Whatever it is, my dearest, I am resolved to put it out of fortune's power to repeat our mortification. I'll haste and prepare for our journey to Scotland this very evening. My friend Honeywood has promised me his advice and assistance. I'll go to him and repose our distresses on his friendly bosom. And I know so much of his honest heart that if he can't relieve our uneasiness, he will at least share them. Exeunt. End of Act Two. Myth. Act Three. Scene. Young Honeywood's house. Bailiff. Honeywood. Follower. Look ye, yes, sir, I have arrested as good men as you in my time. No disparagement of you neither. Men that would go forty guineas on a game of cribbage. I challenge the town to show a man in more gentiler practice than myself. Without all question, Mr... I forget your name, sir. How can you forget what you never knew? <laughs> may I beg leave to ask your name? Yes, you may. Then pray, sir, what is your name? That I didn't promise to tell you. <laughs> A joke breaks no bones, as we say among us that practice the law. You may have reason for keeping it a secret, perhaps. The law does nothing without reason. I'm ashamed to tell my name to no man, sir. If you can show cause as why, upon a special capus, that I should prove my name. But come, Timothy Twitch is my name. And uh, now you know my name, what have you to say to that? Nothing in the world, good Mr. Twitch. But that I have a favour to ask, that's all. Aye, favours are more easily asked than granted, as we say among us that practice the law. I have taken an oath against granting favours. Would you have me perjure myself? But my request will come recommended in so strong a manner as, I believe, you'll have no scruple. Pulling out his purse. The thing is only this. I believe I shall be able to discharge this trifle in two or three days at farthest. But as I would not have the affair known for the world, I have thoughts of keeping you and your good friend here about me till the debt is discharged for which I shall be properly grateful. Oh, 
that's another maxim and altogether within my oath for certain if an honest man is to get anything by a thing there's no reason why all things should not be done in civility doubtless all trades must live mr twitch and yours is a necessary one gives him money oh your honour i hope your honour takes nothing amiss as i does as i does nothing but my duty in so doing i'm sure no man can say i ever give a gentleman that was a gentleman ill usage if i saw that a gentleman was a gentleman i have taken money not to see him for ten weeks together tenderness is a virtue mr twitch ay sir it's a perfect treasure i love to see a gentleman with a tender heart i don't know but i think i have a tender heart myself if all that i have lost by my heart was put together it would make a but no matter for that don't account it lost mr twitch the ingratitude of the world can never deprive us of the conscious happiness of having acted with humanity ourselves humanity sir is a jewel it's better than gold i love humanity people may say that we are in our way have no humanity but i'll show you my humanity this moment there is my follower here little flanagan with a wife and four children a guinea or two would be more to him than twice as much to another now as i can't show him any humanity myself i must beg leave you'll do it for me i assure you mr twitch yours is a most powerful recommendation giving money to the follower sir you're a gentleman i see you know what to do with your money but to business we are to be with you here as your friends i suppose but set in case company comes little flanagan here to be sure has a good face a very good face but then he's a little seedy as we say among us that practise the law not well in clothes smoke the pocket holes well that shall be remedied without delay enter servant sir miss richland is below how unlucky detain her a moment we must improve my good little friend mr flanagan's appearance first here let mr flanagan have a suit of my clothes quick the brown and silver do you hear that your honor gave away to the begging gentleman that makes verses because it was as good as new the white and gold then that your honor i made bold to sell because it was good for nothing well the first that comes to hand then the blue and gold then i believe mr flanagan will look best in blue exit flanagan rabbit me but little flanagan will look well in anything ah if your honour knew that bit of flesh as well as i do you'd be perfectly in love with him there's not a prettier scout in the four counties after a shycock than he scents like a hound sticks like a weasel he was master of the ceremonies to the black queen of morocco when i took him to follow me re-enter flanagan hey hiccard i think he'll look so well that i don't care if i have a suit from the same place for myself well well i hear the lady coming dear mr twitch i beg you'll give your friend directions not to speak as for yourself i know you will say nothing without being directed never you fear me i'll show the lady that i have something to say for myself as well as another one man has one way of talking and another man has another that's all the difference between them enter miss richland and her maid you'll be surprised sir with this visit but you know i am yet to thank you for choosing my little library thanks madam are unnecessary as it was i that was obliged by your commands chairs here two of my very good friends mr twitch and mr flanagan pray gentlemen sit without ceremony aside who can these odd-looking men be i fear it is as i was informed it must be so after a pause a pretty weather very pretty weather for the time of year madam very good circuit weather in the country you officers are generally favourites among the ladies my friends madam have been upon very disagreeable duty i assure you the fair should in some measure recompense the toils of the brave 
our officers do indeed deserve every favour the gentlemen in the marine service i presume sir why madam they do occasionally serve in the fleet madam a dangerous service i am told so and i own it has often surprised me that while i have had so many instances of bravery there we have so few of wit at home to praise it i grant madam that our poets have not written as our soldiers have fought but they have done all they could and hawk or amherst could do no more i am quite displeased when i see a fine subject spoiled by a dull writer we should not be so severe against dull writers madam it is ten to one but the dullest writer exceeds the most frigid french critic who presumes to despise him damn the french the parley vous and all that belongs to them sir <laughs> honest mr flanagan a true english officer madam he's not contented with beating the french but he will scold them too yet mr honeywood this does not convince me but that severity in criticism is necessary it was our first adopting of severity of french taste that has brought them to turn to taste us taste us by the lord madam they devour us give monsieurs but a taste and i'll be damned but they come in for a billyful very extraordinary this but very true what makes the bread rising the parley vous that devour us what makes the mutton five pence a pound the parley vous that eat it up what makes the beer thrums eat me a pot aside ah the vulgar rogues all will be out right gentlemen very right upon my word and quite to the purpose they draw a parallel madam between the mental taste and that of ourselves we are injured as much by the french severity in the one as by french rapacity in the other that's their meaning though i don't see the force of the parallel yet i'll own that we should sometimes pardon books as we do our friends that have now and then agreeable absurdities to recommend them that's all my eye the king only can pardon as the law says for certain case i'm quite of your opinion sir i see the whole drift of your argument yes certainly our presuming to pardon any work is arrogating a power that belongs to another if all have power to condemn what writer can be free by his habeas corpus his habeas corpus can set him free at any time for certain case i'm obliged to you sir for the hint if madam as my friend observes our laws are so careful of a gentleman's person sure we ought to be equally careful of his dear part his fame ay but if so be a man's nab you know mr flanagan if you spoke for ever you could not improve the last observation for my own part i think it conclusive as for the matter of that mayhap nay sir give me leave in this instance to be positive for where there is the necessity of censoring works without genius which must shortly sink of themselves what is it but aiming an unnecessary blow against a victim already under the hands of justice justice oh by the eleventh if you talk about justice i think i'm at home there for in course of law my dear mr twitch i discern what you would be at perfectly and i believe the lady must be sensible of the art with which it is introduced i suppose you perceive the meaning madam of his course of law i protest sir i do not i perceive only that you answer one gentleman before he is finished and the other before he is well begun madam you're a gentlewoman and i will make the matter out this here question is about severity and justice and pardon and the like of they now to explain the thing aside oh curse your explanations enter servant mr leontine sir lo desires to speak with you upon earnest business aside that's lucky dear madam you'll excuse me and my good friends here for a few minutes there are books madam to amuse you come gentlemen you know i make no ceremony with such friends after you sir excuse me well if i must but i know your natural politeness before and behind you know ay ay before and behind before and behind exeunt honeywood bailiff and follower what can this all mean garnet mean madam why what should it mean but what mr loftus sent you here to see 
these people he calls officers are officers sure enough sheriff's officers bailiffs madam ay it is certainly so well though his perplexities are far from giving me pleasure yet i own there is something very ridiculous in them and a just punishment for his dissimulation and so they are but i wonder madam that the lawyer you just employed to pay his debts and set him free has not done it by this time he ought at least to have been here before now but lawyers are always more ready to get a man into troubles than out of them enter sir william honeywood for miss richland to undertake setting him free i own was quite unexpected it has totally unhinged my schemes to reclaim him yet it gives me pleasure to find that among a number of worthless friendships he has made one acquisition of real value for there must be some softer passion on her side that prompts this generosity ha ah, here before me i'll endeavour to sound her affections madam as i am the person that have had some demands upon the gentlemen of this house i hope you'll excuse me if before i enlarged him i wanted to see yourself the precaution was very unnecessary sir i suppose your wants were only such as my agent had power to satisfy partly madam but i was also willing that you should be fully apprised of the character of the gentleman you intend to serve it must come sir with a very ill grace from you to censor it after what you have done would look like malice and to speak favourably of a character you have oppressed would be impeaching your own and sure his tenderness his humanity his universal friendship may atone for many faults that friendship madam which is exerted in too wide a sphere becomes totally useless our bounty like a drop of water disappears when diffused too widely they who pretend most to this universal benevolence are either deceivers or dupes men who desire to cover their private ill-nature by a pretended regard for all or men who reasoning themselves into false feelings are more earnest in pursuit of splendid than of useful virtues i am surprised sir to hear one who has probably been a gainer by the folly of others so severe in his censure of it whatever i may have gained by folly madam you see i am willing to prevent your losing by it your cares for me sir are unnecessary i always suspect those services which are denied and where they are wanted and offered perhaps in hopes of a refusal no sir my directions have been given and i insist upon their being complied with thou amiable woman i can no longer contain the expressions of my gratitude my pleasure you see before you one who has been equally careful of his interest one who has for some time been a concealed spectator of his follies and only punished in hopes to reclaim him his uncle sir william honeywood you amaze me how shall i conceal my confusion i fear sir you'll think i have been too forward in my services i confess sir don't make any apologies madam i only find myself unable to repay the obligation and yet i have been trying my interest of late to serve you having learnt madam that you had some demands upon government i have though unasked been your solicitor there sir i am infinitely obliged to your intentions but my guardian has employed other gentlemen who assures him of success who the important little man that visits here trust me madam he's quite contemptible among men in power and utterly unable to serve you mr lofty's promises are much better known to people of fashion than his person i assure you how we have been deceived and sure as can be here he comes does he remember i'm to continue unknown my return to england has not yet been made public with what impudence he enters enter lofty let the chariot let my chariot drive off i'll visit to his graces in a chair miss richland here before me punctual as usual to the calls of humanity i'm very sorry madam things of this thing should happen especially to a man i have shown everywhere 
and carried amongst us as a particular acquaintance i find sir that you have an art of making the misfortunes of others your own my dear madam what can a private man like me do one man can't do everything and then i do so much in this way every day let me see something considerable might be done for him by subscription it could not fail if i carried the list i'll undertake to set down a brace of dukes two dozen lords and half the lower house at my own peril and after all it's more than probable sir he might reject the offer of such powerful patronage then madam what can we do you know i never make promises in truth i once or twice tried to do something with him in the way of business but as i often told his uncle sir william honeywood the man was utterly impracticable his uncle then that gentleman i suppose is a particular friend of yours meaning me sir yes madam as i often said my dear sir william you are sensible i would do anything as far as my poor interest goes to serve your family but what can be done there's no procuring first-rate places for ninth-rate abilities i have heard of sir william honeywood he's abroad in employment he confided in your judgment i suppose why yes madam i believe sir william had some reason to confide in my judgment one little reason perhaps pray sir what is it why madam but let it go no farther it was i procured him his place did you sir either you or i sir this mr lofty is very kind indeed i did love him to be sure he had some amusing qualities no man was fitter to be a toast-master to a club or had a better head a better head ay at a bottle to be sure he was as dull as a choice spirit but hang it he was grateful very grateful and gratitude hides a multitude of faults he might have reason perhaps his place is pretty considerable i'm told a trifle a mere trifle among us men of business the truth is he wanted dignity to fill up a greater dignity of person do you mean sir i'm told he's much about my size and figure sir ay tall enough for a marching regiment but then he wanted a something a consequence of form a kind of a i believe the lady perceives my meaning oh perfectly your courtiers can do anything i see my dear madam all this is but a mere exchange we do greater things for one another every day why as thus now let me suppose you the first lord of the treasury you have an employment in you that i want i have a place in me that you want do me here do you there interest of both sides few words flat done and done and it's over aside a thought strikes me now you mentioned sir william honeywood madam and as he seems sir an acquaintance of yours you'll be glad to hear he is arrived from italy i had it from a friend who knows him as well as he does me and you may depend upon my information aside the devil he is if i had known that we should not have been quite so well acquainted he is certainly returned and as this gentleman is a friend of yours he can be of signal service to us by introducing me to him there are some papers relative to your affairs that require dispatch and his inspection this gentleman mr lofty is a person employed in my affairs i know your service my dear madam i live but to serve you 
Sir William shall even wait upon him, if you think proper to command it. That would be quite unnecessary. Well, we must introduce you then. Call upon me, let me see, I, in two days. Now, or the opportunity will be lost forever. Well, if it must be now, now let it be. But, damn it, that's unfortunate. My Lord Griggs' cursed Pensacola business comes on this very hour, and I'm engaged to attend another time. A short letter to Sir William will do. You shall have it. Yet, in my opinion, a letter is a very bad way of going to work. Face to face, that's my way. The letter, sir, will do quite as well. Zounds! Sir, do you pretend to direct me? Direct me in the business of office? Do you know me, sir, who I am? Dear Mr. Lofty, this request is not so much his as mine. If my commands, but you despise my power. Delicate creature, your commands could even control a debate at midnight. To a power so constitutional, I am all obedience and tranquillity. He shall have a letter. Where is my secretary? Du Bardieu. And yet, I protest, I don't like this way of doing business. I think if I first spoke to Sir William, uh, but you will have it so. Exit with Miss Richland. Alone. Ha, ha, ha! This, too, is one of my nephew's hopeful associates. O oh, vanity, thou constant deceiver! How do all these efforts to exalt serve but to sink us? Thy false colorings, like those employed to heighten beauty, only seem to mend that bloom which they contribute to destroy. I'm not displeased at this interview. Exposing this fellow's impudence to the contempt it deserves may be of some use to my design. At least, if he can reflect, it will be of use to himself. Enter Jarvis. How now, Jarvis? Where is your master, my nephew? At his wit's end, I believe. He's scarce gotten out of one scrape, but he's running his head into another. How so? The house has but just been cleared of the bailiffs, and now he's again engaging, tooth and nail, in assisting old Croker's son to patch up a clandestine match with a young lady that passes in the house for his sister. Ever busy to serve others? Aye, anybody but himself. The young couple, it seems, are just getting out for Scotland, and he supplies them with money for the journey. Money? How is he able to supply others who has scarce any for himself? Why, there it is. He has no money, that's true. But then, as he never said no to any request in his life, he has given them a bill, drawn by a friend of his upon a merchant in the city, which I am to get changed. For you must know that I am to go with them to Scotland myself. How? It seems the young gentleman is obliged to take a different road from his mistress, as he is to call upon an uncle of his that lives out of the way, in order to prepare a place for their reception when they return. So they have borrowed me from my master as the properest person to attend the young lady down. To the land of matrimony! A pleasant journey, Jarvis. Ah, uh, but I'm only to have all the fatigues on it. Well, it may be shorter and less fatiguing than you imagine. I know but too much of the young lady's family and connections, whom I have seen abroad. I have also discovered that Miss Richland is not indifferent to my thoughtless nephew, and will endeavor, though I fear in vain, to establish that connection. But, come, the letter I wait for must be almost finished. I'll let you further into my intentions in the next room. Exeunt. End of Act Three. Oliver Goldsmith, Act Four. Scene, Croker's House. Enter Lofty. Well, sure the devil's in me of late for running my head into such defiles as nothing but a genius like my own could draw me from. 
I was formerly contented to husband out of my places and pensions with some degree of frugality, but, curse it, of late I have given away the whole court register in less time than they could print the title-page. Yet, hang it, why scruple a lie or two to come at a fine girl? when i every day tell a thousand for nothing ha honey would here before me could miss richland have set him at liberty enter honeywood mr honeywood i'm glad to see you abroad again i find my concurrence was not necessary in your unfortunate affairs I had put things in a train to do your business, but it is not for me to say what I intended doing. It was most unfortunate indeed, sir, but what adds to my uneasiness is that, while you seem to be acquainted with my misfortune, I myself continue still a stranger to my benefactor. How? Not know the friend that served you? Can't guess at the person. Inquire. I have, but all I can learn is that he chooses to remain concealed and that all the inquiry must be fruitless. Must be fruitless? Absolutely fruitless. Sure of that? Very sure. Then I'll be damned if you shall ever know it from me. How, sir? I suppose now, Mr. Honeywood, you think my rent roll very considerable, and that I have vast sums of money to throw away. I know you do. The world, to be sure, says such things of me. The world, by what I learn, is no stranger to your generosity. But where does this tend? To nothing, nothing in the world. The town, to be sure, when it makes such a thing as me the subject of conversation, has asserted that I never yet patronized a man of merit. I have heard instances to the contrary, even from yourself. Yes, Honeywood and there are instances to the contrary that you shall never hear from myself. <laughs> Dear sir, permit me to ask you but one question. Sir, ask me no questions. I say, sir, ask me no questions. I'll be damned if I answer them. I will ask no further. My friend, my benefactor, it is, it must be here, that I am indebted for freedom, for honor. Yes, thou worthiest of men, from the beginning I suspected it, but was afraid to return thanks, which, if undeserved, might seem reproaches. I protest, I do not understand all of this, Mr. Honeywood. You treat me very cavalierly. I do assure you, Sir Blood, Sir, can't a man be permitted to enjoy the luxury of his own feelings without all this parade? Nay, do not attempt to conceal an action that adds to your honour, your looks, your air, your manner. I'll confess it. Confess it, sir. Torture itself, sir, shall never bring me to confess it. Mr. Honeywood, I have admitted you upon terms of friendship. Don't let us fall out. Make me happy, and let this be buried in oblivion. You know I hate ostentation you know i do come come honeywood you know i always loved to be a friend and not a patron i beg this may make no kind of distance between us come come you and i must be more familiar indeed we must heavens can i ever repay such friendship is there any way Thou best of men, can I ever return the obligation? A bagatelle, a mere bagatelle. But I see your heart is laboring to be grateful. You shall be grateful. It would be cruel to disappoint you. How? Teach me the manner. Is there any way? From this moment you're mine. Yes, my friend, you shall know it. I'm in love. And can I assist you? Nobody so well. In what manner? I'm all impatience. You shall make love for me. And to whom shall I speak in your favor? To a lady with whom you have great 
interest, I assure you. Miss Richland. Miss Richland? Yes, Miss Richland. She has struck the blow up to the hilt in my bosom by Jupiter. Heavens, was there anything more unfortunate? It is too much to be endured. Unfortunate, indeed. And yet I can endure it till you have opened the affair to her for me. Between ourselves, I think she likes me. I'm not apt to boast, but I think she does. Indeed, but do you know the person you apply to? Yes, I know you are her friend and mine. That's enough. To you, therefore, I commit the success of my passion. I'll say no more. Let friendship do the rest. I have only to add that if at any time my little interest can be of service, but, hang it, I'll make no promises. You know my interest is yours at any time. No apologies, my friend. I'll not be answered. It shall be so. Exit. Open, generous, unsuspecting man. He little thinks that I love her too, and with such an ardent passion. But then it was ever but a vain and hopeless one. My torment, my persecution. What shall I do? Love, friendship, a hopeless passion, a deserving friend? Love that has been my tormentor, a friend that has, perhaps, distressed himself to serve me. It shall be so. Yes, I will discard the fondling from my bosom, and exert all my influence in his favor. And yet to see her in the possession of another? Insupportable. But then to betray a generous, trusting friend? Worse, worse! Yes, I'm resolved. Let me but be the instrument of their happiness, and then quit a country where I must forever despair of finding my own. Exit. Enter Olivia and Garnet, who carries a milliner's box. Dear me, I wish this journey was over. No news of Jarvis yet. I believe the old peevish creature delays purely to vex me. Why, to be sure, madam, I did hear him say a little snubbing before marriage would teach you to bear it the better afterwards. To be gone a full hour, though he had only to get a bill changed in the city. How provoking! I lay my life, Mr. Leontine, that had twice as much to do, is setting off by this time from his inn, and here you are left behind. Well, let us be prepared for his coming, however. Are you sure you have omitted nothing, Garnet? Not a stick, madam. All's here. Yet I wish that you could take the white and silver to be married in. It's the worst luck in the world in anything but white. I knew one Bet Stubbs, of our town, that was married in red, and as sure as eggs is eggs, the bridegroom and she had a miff before morning. No matter. I'm all in patience till we are out of the house. Bless me, madam. I had almost forgotten the wedding ring. The sweet little thing. I don't think it would go on my little finger. And what if I put in a gentleman's nightcap, in case of necessity, madam? But here's Jarvis. Enter Jarvis. Oh, Jarvis, are you come at last? We have been ready this half hour. Now let's be going. Let us fly. Aye, to Jericho, for we shall have no going to Scotland this bout, I fancy. How? What's the matter? Money, money is the matter, madam. We have got no money. What the plague do you send me out of your fool's errand for? My master's bill upon the city is not worth a rush. Here it is. Mrs. Garnet may pin up her hair with it. Undone! How could Honeywood serve us so? What shall we do? Can't we go without it? Go to Scotland without money. To Scotland without money! <laughs> Lord, how some people understand geography. We might as well set sail for Patagonia upon a cork jacket. Such a disappointment! What a base, insincere man was your master, to serve us in this manner! Is this his good nature? Nay, don't talk ill of my master, madam. I won't bear to hear anybody talk ill of him but myself. Bless us! Now I think on't, madam, you need not be under any uneasiness. I saw Mr. Leontine receive forty guineas from his father just before he set out, and he can't have left the inn. A short letter will reach him there. 
Well remembered, Garnet. I'll write immediately. How's this? Bless me, my hand trembles so I can't write a word. Do you write, Garnet, and upon second thought, it will be better from you. Truly, madam, I write and indite but poorly. I never was cute at my learning. But I'll do what I can to please you. Let me see. All out of my own head, I suppose. Whatever you please. Writing. Master Croker, twenty guineas, madam? Ay, twenty will do. At a bar of the Talbot till called for. Expedition will be blown up. All of a flame. Quick dispatch. Cupid the little god of love. I conclude it, madam, with Cupid. I love to see a love letter and like poetry. Well, well, what you please, anything. But how shall we send it? I can trust none of the servants of this family. Odd so, madam. Mr. Honeywood's butler is in the next room. He's a dear sweet man. He'll do anything for me. He, the dog, you'll certainly commit some blunder. He's drunk and sober ten times a day. No matter. Fly, Garnet. Anybody we can trust will do. Exit Garnet. Well, Jarvis, now we can have nothing more to interrupt us. You may take up the things and carry them on to the inn. Have you no hands, Jarvis? Soft and fair, young lady. You that are going to be married think things can never be done too fast. But we that are old and know what we are about must elope methodically, madam. Well, sure, if my indiscretions were to be done over again. My life for it, you would do them ten times over. Why will you talk so, if you knew how unhappy they make me? Very unhappy, no doubt. I was once just as unhappy when I was going to be married myself. I'll tell you a story about that. A story, when I'm all impatience to be away. Was there ever such a dilatory creature? Well, madam, if we must march, why, we will march. That's all. Though, odd bobs, we have still forgot one thing we should never travel without. A case of good razors and a box of shaving powder. Uh, but no matter. I believe we shall be pretty well shaved, by the way. Going. Enter Garnet. Undone. Undone, madam. Ah, Mr. Jarvis, you said right enough. As sure as death, Mr. Honeywood's rogue of a drunken butler dropped the letter before he went ten yards from the door. There's old Croker has just picked it up, and is this moment reading it to himself in the hall. Unfortunate. We shall be discovered. No, madam, don't be uneasy. He can neither make head nor tail of it. To be sure, he looks as if he was broke loose from bedlam about it, but he can't find what it means for all that. Oh, lud, he is coming this way all in the horrors. Then let us leave the house this instant, for fear he should ask further questions. In the meantime, Garnet, do you write and send off just such another. Exeunt. Enter Croker. Death and destruction are all the horrors of air, fire, and water to be levelled only at me. Am I only to be singled out for gunpowder plots, combustibles, and conflagration? Here it is, an incendiary letter dropped at my door. To Master Croker? These with speed. Ay, ay plain enough the direction all in the genuine incendiary spelling and as cramp as the devil with speed oh confound your speed but let me read it once more reads master croker as soon as you have seen this leave twenty guns at the bar of talbot till called for or you and your expiration will be all blown up ha huh. but too plain blood and gunpowder in every line of it blown up murderous dog all blown up heavens what have i and my poor family done to be all blown up reads our pockets are low and money we must have hi that's the reason they'll blow us up because they've got low pockets reads it is but a short time you have to consider for if this takes the wind the house will quickly be all of a flame. Inhuman monsters blow us up and then burn us. The earthquake at Lisbon was but a bonfire to it. Reads. Make quick dispatch, and so no more at present. But may quip it, the little god of love, go with you wherever you go. The little god of love? 
Cupid, the little god of love, go with me. Go you to the devil, you and your little Cupid together. I am so frightened. I scarce know whether I sit, stand or go. Perhaps this moment I am treading on lighted matches, blazing brimstone and barrels of gunpowder. They are preparing to blow me up into the clouds. Murder! We shall be all burnt in our beds. We shall be all burnt in our beds. Enter Miss Richland. Lord, sir, what's the matter? Murder's the matter? We shall be all blown up in our beds before morning. I hope not, sir. What signifies what you hope, madam, when I have certificate of it here in my hand? Will nothing allow my family? Sleeping and eating, sleeping and eating, is the only work from morning till night in my house. My insensible crew would sleep though rocked by an earthquake and fry beef sticks at a volcano. But, sir, you have alarmed them so often already. We have nothing but earthquakes, famines, plagues, and mad dogs from year's end to year's end. You remember, sir, it is not above a month ago. You assured us of a conspiracy amongst the bakers to poison us in our breads, and so kept the whole family a week upon potatoes. And potatoes were too good for them. But why do I stand talking here with a girl when I should be facing the enemy without? Here, John, Nicodemus, search the house. Look into the cellars to see if there be any combustibles below, and above, in the apartments, that no matches be thrown in at the windows. Let all the fires be put out, and let the engine be drawn out into the yard to play upon the house in case of necessity. Exit. Alone. What can he mean by all this? Yet, why should I inquire when he alarms us in this manner almost every day? But Honeywood has desired an interview with me in private. Well, what can he mean? Or rather, what means this palpitation at his approach? It is the first time he ever showed anything in his conduct that seems peculiar. I'm sure he cannot mean to. But he's here. Enter Honeywood. I presume to solicit this interview, madam, before I left town, to be permitted. Indeed. Leaving town, sir. Yes, madam, perhaps the kingdom. I have presumed, I say, to desire the favour of this interview, in order to disclose something which our long friendship prompts, and yet my fears. Aside. His fears? What are his fears to mine? We have, indeed, been so long acquainted, sir. Very long. If I remember... Our first meeting was at the French Ambassador's. I do recollect how you were pleased to rally me upon my complexion there. Perfectly, madam. I presume to reprove you for painting, but your warmer blushes soon convinced the company that the colouring was all from nature. And yet you only meant it, in your good-natured way, to make me a compliment to myself. In the same manner, you danced that night with the most awkward woman in the company because you saw nobody else who would take her out. Yes, and was rewarded the next night by dancing with the finest woman in company, whom everybody wished to take out. Well, sir, if you thought so then, I fear your judgment has since corrected the errors of the first impression. We generally show to most advantage at first. Our sex are like poor tradesmen that pull all our best goods to be seen at the window. The first impression, madam, did indeed deceive me. I expected to find a woman with all the faults of conscious flattered beauty. I expected to find her vain and insolent. But every day has since taught me that it is possible to possess sense without pride and beauty without affectation. This, sir, is a style very unusual with Mr. Honeywood, and I should be glad to know why he thus attempts to increase the vanity which his own lessons have taught me to despise. I ask pardon, madam. Yet, from our long friendship, I presume that I might have some right to offer, without offence, what you may refuse without offending. Sir, I beg you to reflect. Though, I fear, I shall scarce have any power to refuse a request of yours. Yet, you may be precipitate. Consider, sir. I own my rashness, but as I plead the cause of friendship, of one who loves, don't be alarmed, madam, who loves you with the most ardent passion, whose happiness is placed in you. I fear, sir, I shall never find whom you mean by this description of him. Ah, madam, but it too plainly points him out, though he should be too humble himself to urge his pretensions, or you too modest to understand them. 
Well, it would be affection any longer to pretend ignorance, and I will own, sir, that I have long been prejudiced in his favour. It was but natural to wish to make his heart mine, and he seemed against the ignorance of its value. Aside, I see she has always loved him. I find, madam, you are already sensible of his worth, his passion. How happy is my friend to be the favourite of one with such sense to distinguish merit, and such beauty to reward it. Your friend, sir. What friend? My best friend, my friend, Mr. Lofty, madam. He, sir. Yes, he, madam, he is indeed. What your warmest wishes might have formed him, and to his other qualities he adds that of the most passionate regard for you. Amazement! No more of this, I beg you, sir. I see your confusion, madam, and know how to interpret it, and, since I so plainly read the language of your heart, shall I make my friend happy by communicating your sentiments? By no means. Excuse me, I must, I know you desire it. Mr. Honeywood, let me tell you that you are wrong with my sentiments and yourself. When I first applied to your friendship, I expected advice and assistance. But now, sir, I see it is in vain to accept happiness from him, who has been so bad an economist of his own, and that I should disdain his friendship, who ceases to be a friend himself. Exit. How is this? She has confessed she loved him, and yet she seemed to pardon displeasure. Can I have done anything to reproach myself with? No, I believe not. Yet, after all, these things should not be done by a third person. I should have spared her confusion. My friendship carried me a little too far. Enter Croker, with the letter in his hand, and Mrs. Croker. Ha, ha, ha! And so, my dear, it's your supreme wish that I should be quite wretched upon this occasion. Ha, ha! Mimicking. Ha, ha, ha! And so, my dear... It's your supreme pleasure to give me no better consolation? Positively, my dear. What is this incendiary stuff and trumpery to me? Our house may travel through the air like the house of Loretto, for aught I care, if I am to be miserable in it. Would to heaven it be converted into a house of correction for your benefit. Have we not everything to alarm us? Perhaps this very moment the tragedy is beginning. Then let us reserve our distress till the rising of the curtain, or give them the money they want and have done with them. Give them my money? And pray, what right have they to my money? And pray, what right then have you to my good humour? And so your good humour advises me to part with my money? Why then, to tell your good humour a piece of my mind, I would sooner part with my wife. Here's Mr. Honeywood. See what you will say to it. My dear Honeywood, look at this incendiary letter dropped at my door. It will freeze you with terror, and yet Lovey here can read it, read it and laugh. Yes, and so will Mr. Honeywood. If he does, I will suffer to be hanged the next minute in the rogue's place. That's all. Speak, Mr. Honeywood. Is there anything more foolish than my husband's fright upon this occasion? It will not become me to decide, madam, but doubtless... The greatness of his terrors now will but invite them to renew their villainy another time. I told you he'd be of my opinion. How, oh, sir, do you maintain that I should lie down under such an injury, and show neither my tears nor complaints, that I have something of spirit of a man in me? Pardon me, sir. You ought to make the loudest complaints if you desire redress. The surest way to have redress is to be earnest in the pursuit of it. Hi, whose opinion is he of now? But don't you think that laughing off our fears is the best way? What is the best, madam, few can say? But I'll maintain it to be a very wise way. But we are talking of the best. Surely the best way is to face the enemy in the field, and not wait till he plunders us in our own bedchamber. Why, sir, as to the best, that's a very wise way too. But can anything be more absurd than to double our distresses by our apprehensions? and put it in the power of every low fellow that can scrawl ten words of wretched spelling to torment us. Without doubt, nothing more absurd. How would it not be more absurd to despise the rattle till we are bit by the snake? Without doubt, perfectly absurd. Then you are of my opinion. Entirely. And you reject mine? Heavens forbid, madam, no, sure, no reasoning can be more just than yours. We ought certainly to despise malice if we cannot oppose it, and not make the incendiary's pen as fatal to our repose 
as the highwayman's pistol. Oh, then you think I'm quite right? Perfectly right. A plague of plagues. We can't be both right. I ought to be sorry. I ought to be glad. My hat must be on my head, or my hat must be off. Certainly, in two opposite opinions, if one be perfectly reasonable, the other can't be perfectly right. And why may not both be right, madam? Mr. Croker in earnestly seeking redress, and you in waiting the event with good humour? Pray, let me see the letter again. I have it. This letter requires twenty guineas to be left at the bar of the Talbot Inn. If it be indeed an incendiary letter, what if you and I, sir, go there? And when the writer comes to be paid of his expected booty, seize him. My dear friend, it's the very thing, the very thing. While I walk by the door, you shall plant yourself in ambush near the bar. Burst out upon the miscreant like a masked battery. Extort a confession at once, and so hang him up by surprise. Yes, but I would not choose to exercise too much severity. It is my maxim, sir, that crimes generally punish themselves. Well, but we may upbraid him a little, I suppose. Ay, but not punish him too rigidly. Well, well, leave it to my own benevolence. Well, I do, but remember that universal benevolence is the first law of nature. Exeunt, Honeywood and Mrs. Croker. Yes, and my universal benevolence will hang the dog if he had as many necks as a hydra. End of Act 4 Goldsmith, Act 5 Scene, an inn Enter Olivia and Jarvis Well, we have got safe to the inn, however. Now if the post-chaise were ready... The horses are just finishing their oats, and as they are not going to be married, they choose to take their own time. You are forever giving wrong motives to my impatience. Be as impatient as you will. The horses must take their own time. Besides, you don't consider we have got no answer from our fellow traveller yet. If we hear nothing from Mr. Leontine, we have only one way left us. What way? the way home again not so i have made a resolution to go and nothing shall induce me to break it ay resolutions are well kept when they jump with inclination however i'll go hasten things without and i'll call too at the bar to see if anything should be left for us there don't be in such a plaguy hurry madam and we shall go the faster i promise you exit jarvis Enter landlady. What? Solomon, why don't you move? Pipes and tobacco for the lamb there. Will nobody answer? To the dolphin, quick! The angel has been outrageous this half hour. Did your ladyship call, madam? No, madam. I find as you're for Scotland, madam. But that's no business of mine. Married or not married, I ask no questions. To be sure, we had a sweet little couple set off from this two days ago for the same place. The gentleman for a tailor was to be sure as fine a spoken tailor as ever blew froth from a full pot. And the young lady so bashful, it was near half an hour before we could get her to finish a pint of raspberry between us. This gentleman and I are not going to be married, I assure you. Maybe not. That's no business of mine. For certain Scotch marriages seldom turn out well. There was, of my own knowledge, Miss McFag that married her father's footman. Alack a day! She and her husband soon parted, and now keep separate cellars in Hedge Lane. Aside, a very pretty picture of what lies before me. Enter Leontine. My dear Olivia, my anxiety till you were out of danger was too great to be resisted. I could not help coming to see you set out, though it exposes us to discovery. May everything you do prove as fortunate. Indeed, Leontine, we have been most cruelly disappointed. Mr. Honeywood's bill upon the city has, it seems, been protested, and we have been utterly at a loss how to proceed. How? An offer of his own, too. Sure, he could not mean to deceive us. Depend upon his sincerity. He only mistook the desire for the power of serving us. But let us think no more of it. I believe the post-chaise is ready by this. Not quite yet. And begging your ladyship's pardon— I don't think your ladyship quite ready for the post-chaise. The North Road is a cold place, madam. 
I have a drop in the house of as pretty a raspberry as ever was tipped over tongue. Just a thimbleful to keep the wind off your stomach. To be sure, the last couple we had here, they said it was a perfect nosegay. He cod, sent them both away as good-natured. Up went the blinds, round went the wheels, and drive away, post-boy, was the word. Enter Croker. Well, while my friend Honeywood is upon the post of danger at the bar, it must be my business to have an eye upon about me here. I think I know an incendiary's look, for wherever the devil makes a purchase, he never fails to set his mark. Ha! Ah, who have we here? My son and daughter? What can they be doing here? I tell you, madam, it will do you good. I think I know by this time what's good for the North Road. It's a raw night, madam. Sir? Not a drop more, good madam. I should now take it as a greater favour if you hasten the horses, for I am afraid to be seen myself. That shall be done. Ah, Solomon, are you all dead there? What Solomon, I say? Exit, bawling. Well, I dread lest an expedition, begun in fear, should end in repentance. Every moment we stay increases our danger, and adds to my apprehensions. There's no danger, trust me, my dear. There can be none. If Honeywood has acted with honour, and kept my father as he promised, in employment till we are out of danger, nothing can interrupt our journey. I have no doubt of Mr. Honeywood's sincerity, and even his desires to serve us. My fears are from your father's suspicions. A mind so disposed to be alarmed without a cause will be but too ready when there's a reason. Why let him, when we are out of his power? But believe me, Olivia, you have no great reason to dread his resentment. His repining temper, as it does no matter of injury to himself, so will it never do harm to others. He only frets to keep himself employed, and scolds for his private amusement. I don't know that, but I'm sure on some occasions it makes him look most shockingly. Discovering himself. How does he look now? How does he look now? Ah! Undone! How do I look? Sir, I am your very humble servant. Madam, I am yours. What? You're going off, are you? Then, first, if you please, take a word or two from me with you before you go. Tell me first where you are going, and when you have told me that, perhaps I shall know as little as I did before. If that be so, our answer might but increase your displeasure without adding to your information. I want no information from you, puppy. And you too, good madam. What answer have you got? Hey! A cry without. Stop him! I think I heard a noise. My friend Honeywood without. Has he seized the incendiary? Ha! Huh, no, for now I hear no more on it. Honeywood without? Then, sir, it was Mr. Honeywood that directed you hither? No, sir, it was Mr. Honeywood conducted me hither. Is it possible? Possible? Why, he is in the house now, sir. More anxious about me than my own son, sir. Then, sir, he's a villain. How, sirrah? A villain, because he takes most care of your father? I'll not bear it. I'll tell you I'll not bear it. Honeywood is a friend to the family, and I will have him treated as such. He shall study to repay his friendship as it deserves. Ha, rogue, if you knew how earnestly he entered into my griefs, and pointed out the means to detect them, you would love him as I do. A cry without. Stop him! Fire and fury! They have seized the incendiary. They have the villain, the incendiary in view. Stop him! Stop an incendiary! A murderer! Stop him! Exit. Oh, my terrors! What can this tumult mean? Some new mark, I suppose, of Mr. Honeywood's sincerity. But we shall have satisfaction. He shall give me instant satisfaction. It must not be, my Leontine. If you value my esteem or my happiness, whatever be our fate, let us not add guilt to our misfortunes. Consider that our innocence will shortly be all that we have left us. You must forgive him. Forgive him? Has he not in every instance betrayed us? Force me to borrow money from him, which appears a mere trick to delay us? Promise to keep my father engaged till we were out of danger, and here brought him to the very scene of our escape? Don't be precipitate. We may yet be mistaken. Enter Postboy, dragging in Jarvis, Honeywood entering soon after. Aye, master, we have him fast enough. Here is the incendiary dog. I'm entitled to the reward. 
i'll take my oath i saw him ask for the money at the bar and then run for it come bring him along let us see him let him learn to blush for his crimes discovering his mistake death what's here jarvis leontine olivia what can all this mean why i'll tell you what it means that i was an old fool and that you are my master that's all confusion yes sir i find you have kept your word with me after such baseness i wonder how you can venture to see the man you have injured my dear leontine by my life my honour peace peace for shame and do not continue to aggravate baseness by hypocrisy i know you sir i know you why won't you hear me by all that's just i knew not hear you sir to what purpose i now see through all your low arts you're ever complying with every opinion you're never refusing any request your friendship is common as a prostitute's favours and is fallacious all these sir have long been contemptible to the world and are now perfectly so to me aside huh, contemptible to the world that reaches me all the seeming sincerity of your professions i now find were only allurements to betray and all your seeming regret for their consequences only calculated to cover the cowardice of your heart. Draw, villain. Enter Croker, out of breath. Where's the villain? Where's the incendiary? Seizing the postboy. Hold him fast, the dog. He has the gallows in his face. Come, you dog, confess. Confess all, and hang yourself. Zounds, master, what do you throw me for? Beating him. Dog. Do you resist? Do you resist? Zounds, master, I not he. There's the man we thought was the rogue, and turns out to be one of the company. How? Oh. Mr. Croker, we have all been under a strange mistake here. I find there is nobody guilty. It was all an error. Entirely an error of our own. And I say, sir, that you are in an error, for there is a guilt and double guilt. A plot? a damned jesuitical pestilential plot and i must have proof of it do but hear me what you intend to bring them off i suppose i'll hear nothing madam you seem at least calm enough to hear reason excuse me good jarvis let me then explain it to you what signifies explanations when the thing is done will nobody hear me was there ever such a set so blinded by passion and prejudice to the postboy my good friend i believe you'll be surprised when i assure you sure me nothing i'm sure of nothing but a good beating come then you madam if you ever hope for any favour or forgiveness tell me sincerely all you know of this affair unhappily sir i'm but too much the cause of your suspicions you see before you sir one that with false pretences has stepped into your family to betray it not your daughter not my daughter not your daughter but a mean deceiver who support me i cannot help she's going give her air hi hi take the young woman to the air i could not hurt a hair of her head whose ever daughter she may be not so bad as that neither exeunt all but croker yes yes all's out i now see the whole affair my son is either married or going to be so to this lady whom he imposed upon me as his sister hi certainly so and yet i don't find it afflicts me so much as one might think there is the advantage of fretting away our misfortunes beforehand we never feel them when they come enter miss richland and sir william but how do you know madam that my nephew intends setting off from this place my maid assured me he has come to this inn and my own knowledge of his intending to leave my kingdom suggests the rest but what do i see my guardian here before us who my dear sir could have expected meeting you here and what accident do we owe this pleasure to a fool i believe but to what purpose did you come to play the fool but with who with greater fools than myself explain why mr honeywood brought me here to do nothing now i am here and my son is going to be married to i don't know who that is here so now you are as wise as i am married to whom sir to olivia my daughter 
as i took her to be but who the devil she is or whose daughter she is i know no more than the man in the moon then sir i can inform you and though a stranger yet you shall find me a friend to your family it will be enough at present to assure you that both in point of birth and fortune the young lady is at least your son's equal being left by her father sir james woodville sir james woodville what of the west being left by him i say to the care of a mercenary wench whose only aim was to secure her fortune to himself she was sent to france under the pretense of education and there every art was tried to fix her for life in a convent contrary to her inclinations of this i was informed upon my arrival at paris and as i had been once her father's friend i did all in my power to frustrate her guardian's base intentions i had even mediated to rescue her from his authority when your son stepped in with more pleasing violence gave her liberty and you a daughter but i intend to have a daughter of my own choosing sir a young lady sir whose fortune by my interest with those who have interest will be double what my son has a right to expect do you know mr lofty sir yes sir and know that you are deceived in him but step this way and i'll convince you croker and sir william seem to confer enter honeywood obstinate man still to persist in his outrage insulted by him despised by all i now begin to grow contemptible even to myself how have i sunk by too great an assiduity to please how have i overtaxed all my abilities lest the approbation of a single fool should escape me but all is now over i have survived my reputation my fortune my friendships and nothing remains henceforth for me but solitude and repentance is it true mr hollywood that you are setting off without taking leave of your friends the report is that you are quitting england can it be yes madam and though i am so unhappy as to have fallen under your displeasure yet thank heaven i leave you to happiness to one who loves you and deserves your love to one who has power to procure you affluence and generosity to improve your enjoyment of it and are you sure sir that this gentleman you mean is what you describe him i have the best assurances of it his serving me he does indeed deserve the highest happiness and that is in your power to confer as for me weak and wavering as i have been obliged by all and incapable of serving any what happiness can i find but in solitude what hope but in being forgotten a thousand to live among friends that esteem you whose happiness it will be to be permitted to oblige you no madam my resolution is fixed inferiority among strangers is easy but among those that were once equals insupportable nay to show how far my resolution can go i can now speak with calmness of my former follies my vanity my dissipation my weakness i will even confess that among the number of my other presumptions i had the insolence to think of loving you yes madam while i was pleading the passion of another my heart was tortured with its own but it is over it was unworthy our friendship and let it be forgotten you amaze me but you'll forgive it i know you will since the confession should not have come from me even now but to convince you of the sincerity of my intention of never mentioning it more going stay sir one moment ha he here enter lofty is the coast clear none but friends i have followed you here with a trifling piece of intelligence but it goes no farther things are not yet ripe for a discovery i have spirits working at a certain board your affair at the treasury will be done in less than a thousand years mum sooner sir i should hope well yes i believe it may if it falls into proper hands that know where to push and where to parry that know how the land lies eh honeywood it has fallen into yours well to keep you no longer in suspense your thing is done it is done i say that's all i have just had assurances from 
Lord Neverout, that the claim has been examined, and found admissible. Quietus is the word, madam. But how? His lordship has been at Newmarket these ten days. Indeed. Then Sir Gilbert Goose must have been most damnably mistaken. I had it of him. He? Why, Sir Gilbert and his family have been in the country this month. This month? It must certainly be so. Sir Gilbert's letter did come to me from Newmarket, so that he must have met his lordship there, and so it came about. I have his letter about me. I'll read it to you. Taking out a large bundle. That's from Paoli of Corsica. That from Marquis of Squillaci. Have you a mind to see a letter from Count Poniatowski, now King of Poland? Honest Pon. Searching. Oh, sir, what, are you here too? I'll tell you what, honest friend, if you have not absolutely delivered my letter to Sir William Honeywood, you may return it. The thing will do without him. Sir, I have delivered it, and must inform you, it was received with the most mortifying contempt. Contempt? Mr. Lofty, what can that mean? Let him go on. Let him go on. You'll find it come to something presently. Yes, sir. I believe you'll be amazed if, after waiting some time in the antechamber, after being surveyed with insolent curiosity by the passing servants, I was at last assured that Sir William Honeywood knew no such a person, and I must certainly have been imposed upon. Good. Let me die. Very good. <laughs> now, for my life, I can't find out half the goodness of it. You can't? <laughs> No, for the soul of me, I think it was as confounded a bad answer as ever was sent from one private gentleman to another. And so you can't find out the force of the message? Why, I was in the house at that very time. <laughs> it was I that sent that very answer <laughs> to my own letter. <laughs> Indeed? How? Why? In one word. Things between Sir William and me must be behind the curtain. A party has many eyes. He sides with Lord Buzzard. I side with Sir Gilbert Goose. So that unriddles the mystery. And so it does, indeed. And all my suspicions are over. Your suspicions? What, then you have been suspecting... You have been suspecting, have you? Mr. Croker, you and I were friends. We are friends no longer. Never talk to me. It's over. I say, it's over. As I hope for your favour, I did not mean to offend. It escaped me. Don't be discomposed. Zounds, sir. But I am discomposed, and will be discomposed, to be treated thus. Who am I? Was it for this I have been dreaded both by ins and outs? Have I been libelled in the gazetteer, and praised in the St. James? Have I been chaired at Wildman's, and a speaker at Merchant Taylor's Hall? Have I had my hand to addresses, and my head in the print-shops, and talked to me of suspects? my dear sir be pacified what can you have but asking pardon sir i will not be pacified suspects who am i to be used thus have i paid court to men in favour to serve my friends the lords of the treasury sir william honeywood and the rest of the gang and talk to me of suspects who am i I say, who am I? Since you're so pressing for an answer, I'll tell you who you are. A gentleman as well acquainted with politics as with men in power, as well acquainted with persons of fashion as with modesty, with lords of the treasury as with truth, and with all 
as you are with Sir William Honeywood. I am Sir William Honeywood. Discovering his ensigns of the bath. Sir William Honeywood? Aside. Astonishment, my uncle? So, then, my confounded genius has been all this time only leading me up to the garret in order to fling me out of the window. What, Mr. Importance, and are these your works? Suspect you, you who have been dreaded by the ins and outs, you who have had your aunt to addresses, and your head stuck up in print shops? If you were served right, you should have your head stuck up in the pillory. Aye, stick it where you will, for by the Lord, it cuts a very poor figure where it sticks at present. Well, Mr. Groker, I hope you now see how incapable this gentleman is of serving you, and how little Miss Richland has to expect from his influence. Ay, sir, too well I see it, and I can't but say I have had more boarding of it these ten days, so I am resolved, since my son has placed his affections on a lady of moderate fortune, to be satisfied with his choice, and not run the hazard of another Mr. Lofty in helping him to a better. I approve your resolution, and here they come to receive a confirmation of your pardon and consent. Enter Mrs. Croker, Jarvis, Leontine, and olivia where's my husband come come lover you must forgive them jarvis here has been to tell me the whole affair and i say you must forgive them our own was a stolen match you know my dear and we never had any reason to repent of it i wish we could both say so however this gentleman sir william honeywood has been beforehand with you in obtaining their pardon so if the two poor souls have a mind to marry i think we can tack them together without crossing the tweet for it joining their hands how blessed and unexpected what what can we say to such goodness but our future obedience shall be the best reply and as for this gentleman to whom we owe excuse me sir if i interrupt your thanks as i have here an interest that calls me turning to honeywood yes sir you are surprised to see me and I own that a desire of correcting your follies led me hither. I saw with indignation the errors of a mind that only sought applause from others. That easiness of disposition which, though inclined to the right, had not the courage to condemn the wrong. I saw with regret those splendid errors that still took name from some neighboring duty. Your charity, that was but injustice. Your benevolence, that was but weakness. And your friendship, but credulity. I saw with regret great talents and extensive learning only employed to add sprightliness to error and increase your perplexities. I saw your mind with a thousand natural charms, but the greatness of its beauty served only to heighten my pity for its prostitution. Cease to upbraid me, sir. I have for some time but too strongly felt the justice of your reproaches. But there is one way still left me. Yes, sir, I have determined this very hour to quit forever a place where I have made myself the voluntary slave of all, and to seek among strangers that fortitude which may give strength to the mind, and marshal all its dissipated virtues. Yet, ere I depart, permit me to solicit favor for this gentleman, who, notwithstanding what has happened, has laid me under the most signal obligations. Mr. Lofty? Mr. Honeywood. I'm resolved upon a reformation as well as you. I now begin to find that the man who first invented the art of speaking truth was a much cunninger fellow than I thought him, and to prove that I design to speak truth for the future, I must now assure you that you owe your late enlargement to another. As upon my soul, I had no hand in the matter. So now, if any of the company has a mind for preferment, he may take my place. I'm determined to resign. Exit. How have I been deceived? No, sir. You have been obligated to a kinder, fairer friend for that favor, to Miss Richland. Would she complete our joy, and make the man she has honored by her friendship happy in her love, I should then forget all, 
and be as blessed as the welfare of my dearest kinsman can make me after what has passed it would be but affection to pretend to indifference yes i will own an attachment which i will find was more than friendship and if my entreaties cannot alter his resolution to quit the country i will try if his hands has not power to detain him giving her hand heavens how have i deserved all this how express my happiness my gratitude a moment like this overpays an age of apprehension well now i see content in every face but heaven sent we be all better this day three months henceforth nephew learn to respect yourself he who seeks only for applause from without has all his happiness in another's keeping yes sir i now too plainly perceive my errors my vanity in attempting to please all by fearing to offend any my meanness in approving folly lest fools should disapprove henceforth therefore it shall be my study to reserve my pity for real distress my friendship for true merit and my love for her who first taught me what it is to be happy exeunt omnes end of act five epilogue as puffing quacks some caitiff wretch procure to swear the pill or drop has wrought a cure thus on the stage our playwrights still depend for epilogues and prologues on some friend who knows each art of coaxing up the town and makes full many a bitter pill go down conscious of this our bard has gone about and teased each rhyming friend to help him out an epilogue things can't go on without it it could not fail would you but set about it young man cries one a bard laid up in clover alas young man my writing days are over let boys play tricks and kick the straw not i your brother doctor there perhaps may try what i dear sir the doctor interposes what plant my thistle sir among his roses oh no i've other contests to maintain to-night i head our troops at warwick lane go ask your manager who me your pardon those things are not our forte at covent garden our author's friends thus placed at happy distance give him good words indeed but no assistance as some unhappy wight at some new play at the pit door stands elbowing away while oft with many a smile and many a shrug he eyes the centre where his friends sit snug his simpering friends with pleasure in their eyes sink as he sinks and as he rises rise he nods they nod he cringes they grimace but not a soul will budge to give him place since then unhelped our bard must now conform to bide the pelting of this pitiless storm blame where you must be candid where you can and be each critic the good-natured man End of The Good-Natured Man by Oliver Goldsmith